Our next speaker is Sue Ellen Hopped. Sue is a NCAR senior scientist and the deputy director of the research applications lab RAL at NCAR. And Sue also gave a great talk at the colloquium a couple of weeks back. Thanks, Sue. Look forward to your talk. Okay, I want to confirm that you're seeing my slides. Yeah, it's full screen, but it's cutting off on the side edges that for did, me. It did, did, okay, I clicked, did okay. that do anything? Yeah, ah, okay. this works. Perfect. Great, thanks, thanks Anish. Um, and thanks for inviting me. We've heard lots of talks this week and during the summer school about advances in physics and weight, you know, all the different components uh, that impact S to S prediction. Um, today, I'm going to emphasize some of the tools that we can use to make our life easier as we're trying to advance these physics, specifically machine learning and verification systems. So we'll start with the AI and, and machine learning as a way of thinking about post-processing. Uh, this part of the talk is going to be very synergistic with what David John presented earlier this morning. And I want to talk about um, you know, some work that emerged during a workshop that I attended uh, in October 2019 when we were still attending things in person. And it was the Oxford Conference on Machine Learning for Weather and Climate. Um, and as part of that, we had several breakout groups. I had been asked to lead group four, which was emphasizing post-processing. And the idea here was to think about how can we use post-processing effectively and where, what can we do to try to push it into more operational use? So the idea here is if models do have systematic biases, then we can identify them. If we can identify them and quantify them, of course, we should be able to correct for them as well. And of, you know, some of the easiest methods have been developed back in the 70s, model output statistics, Galan and Lowry. Um, but they, those methods have evolved, so we're now using machine learning approaches. And there was a question about that in David John's talk. And really, it's become ubiquitous and part of most forecasting systems, at least for any applications now, to have machine learning as part of these. And I talked about that a bit at the summer school what industry is doing about it. Um, we can do ensemble calibration with machine learning. We can do re regime dependent prediction um, by separating into EOFs, using k-means clustering, self-organizing maps, et cetera. And we can directly quantify the uncertainty using machine learning. Some folks like Vladimir Krasnopolsky have built uh, artificial neural network ensembles directly, and then folks like Luca Della Monica have popularized an analog ensemble approach where you can build the ensemble based on past predictions using high resolution models. Here I'm uh, just showing a diagram of a typical method uh, where we can bring in a multi-model ensemble. We can correct each of those using a MOS-like approach with either machine learning or multivariate statistics. We can blend them optim optimally. We can include vectors. There's lots of things you can do to improve prediction in this method. And applications often drive the post-processing. Um, you know, when I a couple of weeks ago, when I talked about what industry does, they have clients who want them to do a better forecast than they can get from the national centers. And of course, they bring in machine learning. But there's researchers, obviously, doing research on that, too. A few years back, we were asked to do some machine learning as well as model improvement for solar power forecasting. Um, and through a, a, a project with DOE, we, we really did blend the machine learning with the physics improvements to come up with better predictions for a particular variable. You know, and in this case, you know, a, a variable that can't be directly assimilated easily. Um, so when we strive toward merging the information, 
um, you know, we end up with user relevant information and, you know, that's what we often strive for so that an end user can make decisions and we can support that with these machine learning post-processing approaches. Um, David John talked about using physics constraints for writing the loss functions. I'm not going to go into that in more detail. He did a great job of explaining some details of that. We always get asked questions, what happens with the long-term forecast when you have trends? You can uh, basically you know, work in terms of anomalies on a detrended database, then add the trend back in as we did for a particular project we did a few years ago, looking at uh, climate impact. Um, deep learning is really showing advance in post-processing. And I love showing this example from Will Chapman and, and uh, you know, his team of advisors, um, where they were able to use a convolutional neural net on top of GFS trained to MARA uh, reanalysis data. And they found that the big change was a phase shift. And using this convolutional net, by implementing that phase shift, which is really hard to do with other methods, they were able to significantly improve prediction of atmospheric rivers, you know, as shown in integrated vapor transport. Um, and additionally, we can provide substantial cost value by using these post-processing approach. You know, for example, um, you know, I talked about the analog ensemble, Luca Della Monica wrote a paper where he showed um, the huge computational sa savings you can, you, you can get by building an analog ensemble that verifies uh, in a reliable way, statistically reliable way, that allows you to put your computational costs into having a higher resolution um, base case um, so that you don't have to run as many ensemble members. So the team talked about what is needed to really move forward in deploying post-processing, machine learning post-processing for weather and climate. First of all, is trustworthiness. And again, David John talked about this. You have to have proper benchmarking. Also, interpretability, going beyond that block, black box to explainable methods, things like um, in, input permutation for feature importance, saliency maps, backward optimization. I love showing this example, um, you know, David John on predicting large hail and then using this um, saliency maps, backward optimization and identifying that this dipole structure is one of the structures that produces the large hail. Well, is that realistic? And gee whiz, Andy Heimsfield back in 1980 uh, identified this dipole structure as a feeder cedar mechanism uh, that did produce large hail. Now we need data to be usable and bringing out the FAIR principles, we've heard about that earlier in the workshop, findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, reusable, um, important, we need to really push that. Uh, technique, applying the right methods for the problems, um, you know, very important. We can't just bring in our favorite method every time, um, and we can't just try something new that doesn't apply. And it's important to quantify the uncertainty in addition. So, uh, you know, I, I thought Marika's talk, she was really great in looking at predictability in terms of are we um, you know, is our spread less than our signal? And, you know, these are very important aspects. So the next thing the group addressed was what is a roadmap? What are the actionable things we can do to achieve this vision? And the first thing we decided, we really do need data repositories. There's lots of people out there applying machine learning on different problems. Some of them do a great job, um, you know, most of them do, but there are some folks who are just trying it for the first time. You know, they pull off, a, you know, a Python library and, and just feed data in without really knowing what they're doing. 
really need to be able to compare to some benchmarks. So having a, a data repository will facilitate improving post-processing techniques. Standardizing data, again, getting back to the FAIR principles, bringing in these interpretability methods, needing broad research. David John mentioned the Center for Trustworthy AI and Weather, Climate, and Coastal, Coastal Oceanography. It's led by Amy McGovern at University of Oklahoma, lots of partners, agencies uh, like NOAA included, uh, universities, uh, industry, including some of the big players like IBM, Google, NVIDIA, Vaisala, et cetera. Um, having a group like this making advances can really advance how we use um, machine learning for post-processing and other applications. Metadata in our data, this is really part of the, the FAIR standardization. If we have um, you know, standardized metadata and trying to understand what we have, including having uh, quality control data, labeled training data, you know, very important for advancing the use of machine learning post-processing. And then finally, coming up with a database of failures of AI. So many of us are reinventing the wheel, trying something that somebody else found didn't work earlier. What a waste of time. We can do better if we communicate our failures as well as our successes. So the group decided to put our effort where, where our advocacy was, and we did uh, build a repository as we were advocating for. Um, you can go to this GitHub on NCAR of the data is stored at uh, UCSD. Um, Anish contributed his, his MJO and PN, PNA examples. Uh, Will contributed uh, the integrated vapor transport for the atmospheric river examples. We have data from ECMWF two meter temperature ensemble over Germany and UK surface road conditions. So we encourage those of you who want to try this out, go to this data repository. You know, there's Python uh, assessment tools. Uh, we tried to make it really easy to access this data and try your own methods and compare against the, the benchmarks that are on the site. Now for the second part of my talk, I want to highlight some tools for evaluating um, and, and specifically the model evaluation tools. And this is part of the um, Developmental Testbed Center, which is a collaboration between NCAR, NOAA, some DOD agencies, multiple universities. Um, and I've, I've boldly stolen some slides from Tara Jensen and her Met Plus team in a recent talk that she gave on how their applications are now going into the S2S -S realm. So MET, you know, the, the basis of this is really a composite of over a hundred traditional statistics and diagnostic methods for both point and gridded data sets. There's multiple interpolation methods. It can be applied to spatial and temporal scales, and it's developed for easy sharing of the configuration files. Lots of users, both, both in the US and international. Um, it, it, it's based on GRIB, GRIB2, NetCDF format. Uh, you can use it for gridded or point. Now, MET Plus is a suite of Python wrappers about, uh, you know, around the core. Um, you know, there's, there's viewing systems, there's Python plotting scripts. You know, you can use as much uh, of your own code versus um, as uh, merged with as much of, of MET Plus that you wish. And uh, you know, it, it traditionally has focused on uh, short range weather, medium range, range weather, ensemble prediction, lots of variables. And like I say, recently added capabilities for S to S. So what uh, it does is it allows spatial analysis. There's neighborhood methods um, you know, for upscaling and downscaling. There's masking. 
so that you can allow separating out night day, you can pull out specific latitudes that you might be interested for your particular problem. Uh, there's ensemble methods where you look at uh, scores, CRPS, rank probability, um, you know, probability integral transform, all kinds of you know, spread skill, uh, confidence intervals, as well as more traditional you know, uh, statistics contingency table. There's a big um, mode application here. Um, mode is method for object-based diagnostic evaluation. It allows you to identify objects in your model data and then look how they change over time, how they might morph, you know, stretch, move, et cetera. Um, a large area to study tropical cyclones, um, you know, interpolating to common grids so you can compare data and observations very easily. Now, some of their, if I can get this to advance there, uh, some of their diagnostics are generally useful. Um, you know, they're bringing out now S to S multivariate distributions, multivariate objects, spatial distribution of error of errors, space-time coherence spectra, um, you know, looking at systematic errors, uh, using EOF analysis, all is part of these tools. Again, very easy to apply and merge your own Python code with this downloadable open source MET+. Plus. I'm going to highlight two basic examples. One is uh, related to MJO. Um, you know, first using an index um, outgoing long, ray, long wave radiation based MJO index or an OMI, where you, you can use either models or observations of the OLR. Um, you know, you, you can do these uh, pre processing steps where you may choose to look at a particular section of your grid. You could cut the domain, for instance, to the equatorial section. And then the calculation will automatically filter for 26 to 90 days, regress the OLR onto the EOF patterns, retaining the frequencies of the MJO, and it'll normalize the principal components. So that an output, a possible output, is a phase diagram such as this, where you can look at the evolution in time of the different phases of MJO in terms of OMI. Now, that's not the only index they've used. They also have the real-time multivariate MJO index, or RMM, in addition to OLR, now including both 850 and 200 hectopascal wind fields as, as part of the basis of your EOFs. Again, you can, you can cut out the part of the grid that you're most interested in. Um, the calculation will remove the 120 day mean so that you're looking at anomalies normalized by the square of the variance, regress onto the EOFs, normalized by the principal component standard deviation. Again, getting nice phase plots of the evolution of MJO. You can compare predictions made at different times, as we see here, different colors. Great way to easily uh, put in your data. They do have example data, you know, based on um, NOAA's UFS in there, you know, with some observations as well to go in and try, build your own diagnostics in addition to what here, but based, you know, you, you can download the code and edit it, ed edit the Python code to whatever you want. The other example I'll um, look for, it, you know, I'll, I'll mention is blocks. You know, they've looked at, um, you know, various uh, things you might want to analyze about blocks, uh, specifically central blocking attitude, uh, latitude defined here, uh, you know, high pass filtered nine points weighted by a cosine. Um, and then there's also instantaneous block latitudes, grouped instantaneous block latitudes, frequency of blocking, etc. cetera. Um, you can have, again, in, in, 
you can input either models or ob observations, both. Uh, best to have lots of years if you're going to analyze statistics for blocking. Um, you know, you can regrid to whatever, you know, in, in, you know, here's an example of one degree data. Um, you know, you can look at running means, default is five days, the idea is to compute anomalies. And it does automatically uh, look at each of these four um, objects that, that it wants and it plots the CBLs, the IBLs, or um, you know, the actual blocked events. So an example for the instantaneous blocking latitudes, and okay, they actually have implemented um, you know, identification criteria, the Pelly Hoskins method, which looks for the reversals in the geopotential height gradient, allows for offset from the, um, you know, central blocking latitude, uh, and it looks for easterly equator word flow. Um, they actually pulled the algorithm from Barnes et al. Uh, and I copied in the equation that's actually used. So it's defined as blocked if this function is greater than zero. Uh, you, know, you can plot the 500 millibar height average here. You, know, you can see especially you have the, you know, the, the blocking latitudes, the important blocking latitudes here over Europe, as we know. And when you look at uh, the frequency distribution, again, not surprising that you get, get just west of uh, Greenwich for the highest frequency, second highest. If you look at this, that would be off the, uh, you know, just off the west coast of the U.S. So identifying blocks in your data, very useful. And then group instantaneous blocks as well as blocked events. Um, you can plot, compare, and it writes out um, met files so that you can then analyze further using your own. And you know encourage you to go look at this. Uh, you can download it uh, from GitHub. Um, I'm not the best to ask questions, but Tara uh, loves to respond to user questions. So I put her email on that. And just in summary, you know, really these tools are making it easier to make progress in uh, you know, many areas, both weather, climate, S to S. These machine learning tools, we're finding that inter interpretable deep learning is making inroads. Data archives can really help advance the science. And these rigorous, easy to use validation tools, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and code the same validation codes. And, you know, these ones have been highly vetted, debugged multiple times, and are used by 3,500 users. So I think it's easy to count on them being accurate. So thank you. Thanks very much, Sue. Yeah, it was really interesting, both the machine learning side, but also the MetPlus tools that can be used. Chidong, you have a question for Sue. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm very glad you uh, brought up um, uh, Met, uh, MetPlus. And I was very enthusiastic about these tools until this summer. I had uh, three interns, one computer major, and graduate students all work together, try to learn MATPLUS in a month, and we could not figure out how to use it. And we feel like we must have missed some critical steps, and, but we're clueless. So I just wonder what kind of devices you, you can offer that maybe next summer we will uh, not uh, repeat this failure. Wow, that's, that's too bad, and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, now, they do have MATPLUS um, workshops on an annual basis. And if you could send somebody in your team to the workshop, and I'll be glad to get you information um, on how to sign up for that workshop, maybe that will uh, help in the future. The other thing is to directly engage the Met Plus team, um, and maybe they can help you jumpstart, uh, you know, to get going a little bit more quickly. So um, they, that's what they do is they engage with users. So instead of letting your intern spin their wheels, I really uh, encourage you to have, uh, have them reach out to the MetPlus team and maybe get some good hints on how to get started, how to download da 
the data, the tools, et cetera, so that they can be off and running much more quickly. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Shiron. Judith, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I'm putting a note to connect you with Tara. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so, Alan, um, I have a machine learning question. It's a very fundamental one. And I would be interested in your perspective. And this is that I think we have had great process in uh, um, uh, estimating model errors or errors in post-processing and, and improving forecasts um, in a post-processing step. Um, where I'm struggling with is how we can use machine learning to um, uh, find unrepresented processes or erroneously represented processes in our models. And I was wondering if you could comment on what are the first steps to do more along these lines. And Libby has been talking about this relevance map, and I, I understand this, but I wanted to get your perspective on it. Yes, and you know, I, I, I think that really is, you're, you're getting at the edge of research in collaboration between the modelers, the, you know, who are writing the physics routines, the machine learning folks. Um, I think that's why a lot of progress is being made by uh, many folks who are trained in physical science and then have learned the machine learning in parallel or after the fact, you know, like I did, because when I was in school, there was no machine learning type courses. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, David John's paper was a great example of how he used, you know, these um, saliency maps, you know, the backward propagation um, to be able to identify features in the models, but it was based on model data. And we often do our work on the model data uh, because it's easy to get nice gridded data from the models. What we often don't have is observation data. And to recognize what's wrong with our models, we probably want to do it in terms of observations. But even to grid our observations, we often do reanalyses, which, which automatically uh, put it in terms of the model physics. I think we need to get to the place where we trust our observations well enough that we can go directly from some observational data. You know, now that we have uh, GO-16 data and equivalent satellite data from across the world, um, you know, if we can look at some variables that we can composite over the globe, um, you know, uh, from the satellite data, perhaps we can get it working really with observations, then compare it to our models. You know, not that there aren't problems with observations as well, but, uh, you know, even the, sa the satellite data as well. But, you know, to really work um, with all three at once, the observational data, the model data, and the machine learning saliency methods that after we have trained um, you know, to do whatever type of prediction we want. And identifying features, you know, just like these MedPlus tools do, is really helpful. Great. Thanks, Judith, and thanks, Sue. Jacqueline, did, do you have a question? I saw your hand raised and then lowered. If not, Oh, my question was very similar to you, okay, okay. but I, I would like to add uh, something, I guess. Uh, I guess it's related to the collaboration. I know there is like this machine learning community is growing and there there is also this like dynamical model community. So I was just wondering if, if there is this effort, ongoing effort of collaboration between these two groups in a way that machine learning can help to improve oh. dynamical models and like the, the, you know, this feedback between these two communities, because I think when we were, um, so some students were talking about this, like we're afraid that people are just gonna go and use machine learning only, and they are, they are gonna forget about the dynamical models. And like, we have to be aware of, this issue. So I was just wondering if there is an ongoing effort um, or, yeah. No, and, and you bring out an excellent point. You know, 
we learned a lot about dynamics over the years. I mean, back in the 60s, in the days of, you know, Lorenz and Leith, they were trying to figure out what were the best ways forward using the dynamical models, or at that time, what they were looking at as statistical learning, you know, really before we were talking about machine learning much. And, um, you know, the, the numerical methods won out because the computer power really was applied that way. We had more computer power than data at the time. But a lot of the people who got into machine learning, you know, like myself, were originally modelers. Um, I still run modeling projects in addition to running machine learning projects. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out, out there like that. NOAA in particular, um, they have folks working closely between the modelers and the machine learning folks. Um, at NCAR, we do that too. Uh, you know, with CGD, there's examples of like Katie Dagan, who was trying to interpret um, her, her climate model data, who applied machine learning to facilitate it. You know, David John has shown examples, and that HAIL example was based on using model data, trying to interpret the model. So you're absolutely right. Getting the model people together with the machine learning people is the best way forward to make progress. Great. I I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Janak, if you could post your question in the chat, and Sue, if you could re reply on the chat, that would be really great. I think we are, yeah, 15 minutes over. So thanks a lot again, Sue, for the great talk and for the discussion. Mm -hmm.